Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. This is um, a webinar of Myeloma Patients Europe, and it's a very important topic that we're covering today. We often discuss about clinical outcomes, about survival, about how to improve outcomes um, of patients uh, living with a multiple myeloma. But today, we have a topic that is equally important, but often not so much in the radar of people, which is about the importance and challenges of measuring quality of life in myeloma trials. So we have a distinguished panel today to discuss um, uh, these issues from different perspectives. And before I go into the content and also introduce the panelists, just some housekeeping rules um, for this webinar. So on the next slide, you can actually see um, that you uh, will see the uh, presenters, but you will not hear or see other attendees because it's a Zoom webinar. If you cannot hear the presenters, make sure that your speakers are not muted and the volume is set too high. You can also later on when we have the panel, uh, go into the gallery view um, in the view settings of Zoom on the upper right corner of your screen, because that way you can then see all cameras of the people during the panel. Uh, you don't need to do that today, uh, to, uh, just now, but you can do it later on. And if you have questions, you see the little Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, and uh, this is actually the question and answers function of Zoom. And you can submit your questions there. We're going to see them and screen them while we hear, listen to the presenters. And I'll try to raise these questions then also to uh, the speakers. As a next, um, uh, next topic, actually, we're going to have a panel and Q&A session after the end of all presentations. Uh, so please write your questions in the chat and I'll try to ask them uh, to everyone. You can also use the chat function, uh, which you can also find at the bottom of the uh, Zoom screen so you can chat with other participants. But please, if you have questions to the speakers, please do that on Q&A because it's much easier for us as moderators to actually see um, uh, see the questions. If you're having any trouble with for video or the signal cutting in or out, you can also turn off video and just keep audio on. If there are any uh, technical difficulties, you also find the MPE team uh, in the chat so you can actually uh, mention any issues um, that are there. And finally, we're going to record this webinar uh, so it will be available on the um, MPE website uh, where you can see the, uh, the domain app actually here and also on social media channels. All right, um, so going into the, the agenda for today, we have in total one and a half hours. Uh, we're going to do a bit of introductions in the beginning, but keep that very brief. We're going to have a presentation by Maloma Patients Europe and Con Concilium Scientific Research, um, and then actually go into a panel discussion um, and also address your Q&A. Um, you will also see that we're going to try to close this webinar on time sharp because everybody is so full of virtual meetings. So we're going to close this meeting at uh, 4.30. Okay, so let's move into um, the, the panel we have today. And I didn't introduce myself, uh, but probably I should do that now. My name is Jan Geisler. I've, I've been a cancer patient, a leukemia patient, and patient advocate for about 21 years. I'm CEO of Padvocates. And we're going to have uh, two speakers in the very beginning, which I'm asking to introduce themselves. Um, but uh, you can see all the speakers here. We're going to introduce the other panelists later on when, when we go into the panel discussion. So first of all, I'd like to hand over to Lisa Ospienko. She's Chief, Chief Executive Officer of Consilium Scientific, and she's going to speak about quality of life data and myeloma research results. So Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jan. So, yes, I head Consilium Scientific now. This is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving quality of clinical research. But my background is at NICE, and uh, I've been the head of um, scientific advice for five years at NICE. And I looked at quite a lot of trials and uh, work with myeloma trials and myeloma community in the past. So I'm very grateful for Myeloma Patients Europe commissioning this very important work. Uh, it was a very personal interest of mine to see how quality of life data collection changed over the years. And um, it was interesting project for us. So I'm happy to present the results. Next slide. Next slide. So we looked at uh, all registered trials for over the 10 year period between 2011 and 2021 um, across all registries um, to which we have access. So this is 18 registries 
Um, and uh, most trials are, of course, are in European registry and clinicaltrials.gov, but we also looked at um, global registries. And uh, there's a lot of duplication of records. So our methodology included cleaning the um, record, making sure we don't double count the particular trial. Uh, we discarded all the terminated, uh, withdrawn, suspended trials for analysis. However, it's very important to understand that the data I'm presenting here is not on completed myeloma trials, but it's on completed and ongoing myeloma trials. So we're here not reviewing results which are published in the paper, but the actual protocols. So it's a promise of collection of quality of life data, either as primary, secondary, or exploratory endpoint. So from our analysis, we identified um, over 1,500 um, trials which, uh, with um, multiple myeloma patients over the 10-year period. Next. And um, because this project was done specifically for myeloma patient Europe, we've done a sub-analysis on trials that included at least one European country. Here, I will be presenting data only on all trials that we have evaluated, not looking specifically into Europe. Next. Um, this is the 10-year results, um, uh, longitudinal data in terms of uh, number of trials that collected uh, quality of life data in relation to the number of trials that did not collect quality of life data. But I think next slide is uh, showing um, data a bit more clearly. It's the percentage of trials that collected quality of life data in particular year. And I'm sure now you will have a lot of questions saying, but hold on, it all depends whether it's an observational trial or an interventional trial, or it's phase three or it's phase zero. So, and we have this granularity of data for you, but I think this longitudinal presentation is quite important because I personally been at NICE for quite a few years and preaching the importance of quality of life data collection to every developer really was expecting to see a very strong upward trend over 10 years. And here we do not see it. Um, actually on average, it's pretty, pretty stable and quality of life data collection in clinical trials myeloma is around 36 um, percent. Next slide. So we looked at um, who, who actually runs these trials and uh, for myeloma specifically and it actually differs by clinical area but for myeloma specifically you can see that the top shares are run by industry and academia. Next slide. And uh, here we did analysis in terms of also quality of life data collection by sponsor. And um, I uh, am really curious of the uh, magic non-specified sponsors of trials. They're doing a really good job. I'd like to congratulate them. But uh, when they say not specified, basically this information is not in the registry, but they seem to be doing a great job collecting quality of life data. But it, of course, it's a very small proportion. And this is a technical administrative error of not entering the actual sponsor. So as you see, Surprisingly, academia could have done better um, in terms of collecting quality of life data, um, but um, industry is doing very well uh, compared um, to, to other settings, but are they doing enough? Next slide, please. So we, uh, as you can imagine, most trials uh, registered uh, interventional, they might be running many more um, observational trials in any clinical <clears throat> disease, but uh, not all trials um, actually end up in the registries, unfortunately, <clears throat> but most interventional trials are registered. Next slide. So in terms of this distribution, um, you see that quality of life data as expected is collected in more interventional trials than observational. Next slide. Uh, then we looked at the types of myeloma. It's a, a very a detailed slide, as you see, and the most trials are happening in relapsed refractory setting, uh, which is not surprising. And um, But there's a growing number in newly diagnosed myeloma patients. 
And uh, the next slide presents uh, the distribution of that quality of life data collection uh, based on the type of multiple myeloma. And of course, these two slides better be looked at side by side because here you cannot really uh, look at smoldering myeloma and say, um, how, how well it's performing against um, relapsed only because the number of trials is significantly different. But once again, for uh, people with specific type of myeloma, or for clinicians looking at specific type of myeloma, this data, this information is important. Next. Uh, we looked at trial phases because, of course, that's a very legitimate question. When uh, should you collect quality of life data? When it makes sense for analysis? When is the burden for the patient? And, um, of course, as um, for most um, medical conditions, we have quite a few phase one trials, quite a few phase two trials. Uh, but very few make it further up the scale, and we have a smaller number of phase three and phase four trials. Um, next slide. And this is the distribution of quality of life data collection by phase. And I'm very pleased to see that, of course, for phase three uh, is the only area where we can see more trials collecting quality of life data than not collecting. So that's a healthy trend. Why is it at 55% only or 50, uh, 56%? It's uh, uh, a question and they would we would love to see more. What's concerning is um, a quite low number in phase four. And um, at least we have some data in phase two, but it would be good to see more quality of life data in these trials. And we'll explain why in discussion. Next. So uh, here we'll look at uh, the primary purpose of the trials. As you see, most trials in multiple myeloma are um, the purpose of the trial is treatment. Next slide. And we've done this analysis as well. And um, this is our average statistics corresponding to all the findings that only about 40% of trials uh, dedicated to treatment collect quality of life data. It is concerning because these are international trials. A lot of times patients are exposed to regimens or medications, interventions, which they um, which haven't been tested before in these populations. So... Um, but th this is what we found so far. Next slide. So that was analysis of trials in the registries um, of all the, all the protocols of ongoing trials and completed trials. But we also thought uh, it would be very interesting to see what is the literature saying about this. And, uh, uh, of course, to get into the literature, this is a very different um, subgroup of trials or studies, because uh, to get into the literature, they have to be completed and published. Uh, we have not looked at any protocols because they were picked up through um, the previous uh, research. Please, next slide. So we, through systematic review, we identify 554 articles, which considered quality of life data. Um, next slide. Next. And uh, there were three types of uh, research. Uh, so it's primary research, so reporting on clinical trials, secondary research, which included systematic reviews, and uh, economic evaluation. Next. Um, so in the final analysis, uh, we selected 266 articles, all the methodologies available through additional information we have from Prisma chart to uh, inclusion exclusion criteria. Next. Uh, so, as you can see, primary research um, was the highest proportion of the articles that we found. And uh, the question here is also about the years because we looked at the 10 year period. So these are the articles published during those 10 years. And this is a mismatch with uh, actual trials in the registry, which can, can be ongoing. So some trials we matched uh, that we found in the registries to the ones published. But here there are quite a few published articles on primary research, which started prior to the years of our analysis prior to 2011 in order to report during that period. But uh, once again, I, I, despite the years included, I think these are also very interesting trends to see what, what we found through the literature. Next. Um, 
I was pleased to see that reporting of quality of life data in primary research has been increasing. Um, and this is also the trend through secondary research uh, with economic evaluation, very few articles were found. So not that the trend, there's no trend to, to report here. Next. Uh, very uh, poor uh, public publication record, I have to say, in terms of access to full paper. Most information was available in either abstract-only forms or conference proceedings, and that's a major disadvantage because in the abstract, only very um, top-level information is given. There is no granularity that can be explored in fully published research. So we extracted whatever we could extract, but my only recommendation here is this is important work, and this is important work for patients, and uh, uh, seeing more publications actually providing further details would be important. Next. So what we found is... Um, um, here in publications, uh, quality of life data was collected mostly uh, in primary research and um, is reported very little um, came from economic evaluation. Um, but this is the also look at population types. You can see that this is a more aggregate uh, level of analysis. We did not have such details as smoldering myeloma. Um, for example, but it does show you um, what uh, what is the distribution for different types of myeloma populations. Next. Um, this was a surprising finding for us uh, across literature review and across the registries. We actually extracted all instruments we found through protocols, through the articles, to see what is actually being used in myeloma clinical trials. And we found 93 instruments, and that is a lot. So uh, there is a prevalence for generic instruments, which are listed here. Uh, there is a um, use of um, cancer, definitely um, cancer specific go in the second place. And uh, myeloma specific instruments are also used. Uh, quite a few studies use combination of these instruments if they if they collect quality of life data at all. But this variety uh, of approach to quality of life data collection, and once again, we focused only on the instruments we could identify because, um, as we know, there are other explore, explorations through surveys and interviews uh, to understand. Um, patient states, um, especially for CAR Ts or new technologies, this is not included in this analysis. So this is just standardized quality of life instruments. Next step, next, please. <clears throat> so there's a um, overall use of instruments in uh, myeloma research, and uh, you can see there's a big prevalence for <clears throat> generic instruments in. Uh, primary research and um, uh, also combination of generic and cancer specific. So myeloma instruments feature in, in some trials or in some studies, but no, not as much. Next, please. Uh, so the last thing we've done is we looked at uh, NICE appraisals and how the committee and the um, evaluation group looked at quality of life data submitted by the manufacturers. Next. Um, so in total, um, the, there were 28 technology appraisals, uh, but only uh, 14 were in scope for this study because once again, we looked at the 10 year period and uh, some technology appraisals were terminated. Uh, so we did the analysis on 14 technology appraisals. Next, please. And uh, 26 clinical trials in multiple myeloma were included in those 14 TAs. Next. Uh, this is the populations which were analyzed in these technology appraisals, uh, very equal distribution uh, for newly diagnosed relapsed only and relapsed refra refractory. Next. Um, since it's nice technology appraisal, this is um, the company is required to submit the registrational trials. And uh, over the last 10 years, um, most trials were in phase three um, in order to uh, uh, receive a marketing authorization and come to NICE. So most trials were in phase three. Next. 
And these are the instruments uh, which were identified in multiple myeloma uh, technology appraisals. So as you see, usual suspects, we had EQ5D, uh, we, can, we had the ERTC QLQ, um, C30 and the myeloma specific tool MY20. Next. Um, so where the data came from, I think that's quite important because that actually led to debates and criticism from the committee. So uh, only eight appraisals used trial only data, so directly collected data in the clinical trial. Four appraisals used literature only data. It means no data was collected in the trial at all, or the quality of data collected was not uh, acceptable for evaluation. And two technology appraisals used the mix of um, data from the trial and from the literature. Next. Uh, so quality of life uh, was um, uh, dedicated as a secondary endpoint in non-technology appraisals. And um, in 17 uh, appraisals, it was not, sorry, trials, it was not collected as an endpoint at all. And it's not surprising, but just a statement that the quality of life was not a primary endpoint in any of the trials, but these are registrational uh, treatment trials, so it would not be expected. Next. So and that's uh, the final uh, conclusion, so that uh, there were major issues with quality of clinical, uh, quality of life data in the technology appraisal. Um, in five appraisals, and there were minor issues in nine appraisals. Next. Uh, so this is just a summary why the technology was approved uh, at NICE. So um, four technologies went to Cancer Drugs Fund because there was not sufficient um, information on clinical effectiveness of the product and it was expensive. Two went into the patient access scheme. One was found to be cost-effective and seven were found to be clinically and cost-effective and decision was made right away. Next. So this is the summary of this work and the next slide. Um, overall, uh, quality of life data was collected in 36% of registered myeloma clinical trials through the literature search and uh, our database of registered trials, we identified 93 different quality of life instruments used in myeloma clinical trials and clinical research. And um, data uh, from NICE showed that in five out of 14 technology appraisals, quality of life data raised significant issues which impacted decision-making process. And um, this is just the final point. I have to say multiple myeloma is quite good compared to other areas but uh, 547 out of 1,557 uh, multiple myeloma clinical trials uh, were completed, but only 63% of them reported results within uh, 18 months of the trial completion date, and the requirement is to report the results within 12 months. So there is a lag, and um, very important to get the reporting of results to patients, to the clinical community, and to the public on time. Um, this is it. So thank you very much for your time and looking forward to the discussion and your questions. Thank you so much, Lisa, for presenting the data. That's really brilliant and so interesting from a patient advocacy point of view, given that on one hand, a lot of um, trials do not collect the data um, on quality of life and also um, that, uh, let's say, the delay is so, so long for getting that Quality of, light, uh, quality of life data out there because patients don't want old hats and it also needs to influence clinical decision-making. So a lot of food for thought, which we're going to discuss in the discussion later on. But before we do that, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, which I guess everyone knows, Kate Morgan, uh, Co-Chief uh, Chief Executive Officer of Myeloma Patients Europe. So what does the patient community now think about what are your recommendations? So Kate, over to you. Hi everyone, um, thanks Jan for the introduction. Um, so I'm Co-Chief Executive Officer here at Myeloma Patients Europe and I'd like to thank um, the chair and the speakers um, and everyone who's joined the webinar today um, and hopefully we'll have a lively discussion. Um, in my presentation, I, I just want to go through some advocacy recommendations from our perspective and what we've taken from the data. Next slide, please. And next one. <laughs> um, 
So just to, to provide you with a, a little bit of context as to why we commissioned the report and the research um, with Concilium Scientific. And I think um, we really wanted to generate some evidence on how quality of life data is measured over time. And I think from our perspective, um, quality of life can be quite difficult to navigate for patient organisations. It's quite complex. Um, we hear anecdotally that, that perhaps it's not being systematically gathered um, and that that sometimes impacts on access decisions at a national level. But we had no data to kind of back up what we were saying. Um, so we wanted to, to work with Lisa to understand the gaps, the challenges, um, and really to, to derive some advocacy um, messages and goals uh, for the community and to sort of advocate for going forward. Um, and we'll be publishing the report in full um, next Monday on the 5th. So um, we'll send that out to everyone who's participated along with the full report. Um, but today we wanted to, to present some of our um, recommendations that we've generated um, to stakeholders um, to have a panel discussion about them and also um, to hear your thoughts um, um, on, the, on ways that we can refine them and, and improve them. And I should say we're not advocating here um, that quality of life is more important than other endpoints. Um, we just really wanted to, to shine a light on, on how quality of life is being generated um, and how we can improve that for the patient community. Um, next slide, please. So our first recommendation um, is that we think that researchers um, should consider the collection of quality of life data in all myeloma clinical trials. And I think from our perspective, this should be done at least from phase two, and when you're starting to think about um, generating data for access. Um, but I think in situations where um, in cell and gene therapy, where the only trial is likely to be a phase one or phase two um, when you're bringing it to market, then perhaps quality of life should be generated in those clinical trials. And I know that there, there is sometimes an issue around single arm data um, and we'd be interested to hear the perspectives on the panel on how, how that challenge could be addressed. Um, we'd like to see We'd like to see the, the use of two different kinds of patient reported outcome measure. Um, I think um, NICE and, and other HTA bodies often require generic um, tools to be used um, to, to factor into their decision making because you can compare them across diseases. Uh, but also um, we've seen from Lisa's um, presentation that um, myeloma specific tools aren't routinely used, but they should be being used to ensure that we get myeloma specific data. One um, issue we've been discussing is around the potential role of ethics committees in uh, facilitating improvements in quality of life. So could an ethics committee um, potentially um, not mandate, but ask industry to, to present their quality of life um, plans for the clinical trial and then um, justify it where um, they aren't able to provide that? Um, so we're interested to hear perspectives on that topic. Um, and I think um, when, you, when industry and researchers have developed their, um, their PRO um, strategy for a clinical trial, I think it's really important to run it past um, health economists, um, take it to sort of nice scientific advice, scientific advice um, with the European Medicines Agency, but also involve patient representatives. So at MPE, we have a task force, for example, where we train patient advocates on how to review protocols and how to review um, PRO uh, methods. Um, and so that's, that can be really useful to help reduce the burden on patients because they can tell you whether it's too burdensome um, and you can amend your approach. And also finally, into Lisa's last point as well, is that where quality of life data is collected, it should really be reported. Um, I think it's very important to assist patients um, in their decision making, and it should also be presented in a patient friendly way. Next slide, please. So the second recommendation is around researchers collaborating to create an online and user-friendly database of myeloma PROMs. So what are the most important PROMs that should we, we should be using? How, could, how have they been developed? What patients involved? Um, really a checklist just to see whether um, the tool is suitable. And I know that EHA um, and Sam Salak, who's who joined the panel today, are working on their own guidelines for this. So perhaps we could use um, their approach as a basis for, for doing this um, and really help um, researchers understand um, what is and is not appropriate for PRO collection. 
Next slide, please. So the third point is around the potential for clearer recommendations on the collection of quality of life data and clinical development to support regulatory and HTA decision making. So I know there's a lot of work going on on that um, at European level and also with the FDA, um, but is, is there anything further that we could be doing to make sure that the requirements are very clear to industry and to other researchers on how they should be uh, generating PRO data and also how it's taken into account? And also, I think um, from my perspective, we see that um, sometimes um, industry and researchers might get advice from regulatory bodies, from HDA bodies and from patient organisations like ourselves on how to measure PROs um, within the context of clinical trials and perhaps there are ways that we can align that and collaborate um, and really set the clear standards for expectation. Next slide please. And finally, I think, um, so building on the last point as well, um, perhaps an international multi-stakeholder steering group could be formed comprising of patients, um, PRO methodologists, um, regulators and policy makers to establish a more consistent approach in, in collecting and assessing quality of life data in myeloma. And this wouldn't replace the, the sort of pan-European level uh, guidance that I mentioned in the previous recommendation, but would really add to it um, and really think about how um, we tailor um, the development of quality of life and PROs in myeloma um, specifically. Um, and again, there is the potential to use EHA guidelines um, as a basis. Um, and I think generally we'd like to see um, a framework through these recommendations for more integrating and consistent, consistent ways of collecting and, and assessing quality of life. Next slide. So thank you very much for listening. And I think, as I mentioned at the start, please um, let MP know if you have any further comments um, about the, rep the report and the recommendations after the webinar, because um, we're really happy to, to hear feedback and um, whether the recommendations are um, viable. And as a reminder, please post any questions or comments um, in the chat and um, we can address them in the panel. Super. Thank you so much, Kate very clear recommendations and also a strong call to uh, all different kind of stakeholders to take quality of life more into account. We're going to discuss much more of that and I'm very happy now to um, welcome our other panelists to this to this discussion, uh, which is uh, Professor Sam Salek from the University of Hertfordshire. Um, he's also um, EHA Scientific Working Group uh, co-chair on quality of life. Uh, Simone Erlemans um, from the uh, Netherlands Comprehensive Cancer Center and also member of the ERGC Quality of Life Group. We have uh, Dr. Beate Wieseler, head of Department of Drug Assessment at ICWIC, and Francesco Pignatti from the EMA, Scientific Advisor for Oncology. So a really fantastic panel uh, together with you, Kate and Lisa. Um, it's really great to discuss uh, with you about um, all the different issues that we heard before. And probably just to, to kick off the discussion, I mean, we've heard a lot about, let's say, how much is or how, how little is quality of life data being gathered in clinical trials. And we heard a strong call for the community, how important it is. So probably just as a lead in discussion uh, question, um, I'd like to raise it to Simone. So why do you think um, is um, generating quality of life data in clinical trials in myeloma so important? Yes, Jan, thank you very much. Can you can you all hear me? Super. Perfect. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for joining uh, this panel. It's been wonderful. And also, like, uh, I want to congratulate MPE and also, like, uh, Consalium Scientific for this great amount of work and this, this great report. So, um, why is generating quality of life data so important in clinical trials? Um, I think that, well, in the past decades, there have been a lot of novel agents changing uh, MM management. And um, there are nowadays a lot of treatment options and also a lot of treatment combinations. And the toxicity profiles differ between these, these treatment agents. Um, some chemotherapies are, for example, known of their possibility to have nerve damage which have an enormous impact on patients' quality of life. For example, they cannot button their, their blues or they cannot close their, their pants. 
And uh, with this kind of information, if you know that some kind of treatments do have these side effects and other treatments do not have these side effects, then you can make uh, a decision based on that, or you can have that extra information besides the survival outcome of a trial to, to base your decision on. So I think that's a very important aspect that with this information, you have a more complete picture uh, of, of an outcome of a trial. And another important thing, I think, in why we should use patient reported outcome measures in clinical trials is that, um, of course, we can, we clinicians can report on side effects and they can use like common criteria to rate side effects. But we have also learned in the past decades that uh, if, if clinicians rate a, a patient side effect, they rate it less frequently and less severe than if a patient rates it themselves. So, for example, then um, the, the view of the clinicians are an underestimation of what patients experience. So I think, therefore, if we really want to focus what are key areas for patients with multiple myeloma, um, we also have to focus on and also have to include uh, patient reported outcome data uh, in clinical trials. Thank you so much. I mean, Sam, uh, Sam Salik, you've been involved so, so, so deeply in all different kinds of activities around quality of life and have also been involved in developing HM Pro. So what's, what's your perspective? Why is it so important? Why should we bother multiple myeloma? Thank you very much, Jan. Um, I just like, before I answer that question, I just want to um, perhaps um, paint a positive picture on where we are. Um, now, it was only about 18 years ago that I was uh, at an FDA meeting behind a closed door, and some of the key um, uh, players in FDA uh, who were very involved in the CEDA um, assessment of dossier, um, it came out of their mouth and they said categorically, anything based on patient's perspective is of no value. And I remember about 38 years ago when I started to uh, look at the development and measurement of quality of life, I used to go to clinicians trying to persuade them to do quality of life studies. They thought that I was coming from a different planet. Um, and I was talking double Dutch when I was talking about quality of life. So that's where we were and this is where we are today. I think there are you know, success stories of you know, how much we have uh, really uh, come along in it's all to do with the, the mindset. We we'll really have to try to change the mindset that quality of life is something that is different to the clinical parameters. As Kate very elegantly put it, you know, it's not to replace it, but it's really painting something to the rest of the picture that you know, clinical parameters by medical values cannot tell us, and that is the patient's voice. At the end of the day, they are at the receiving end of these treatment, and it's important to really include their voice in the whole assessment of uh, the value of a, of a treatment. Um, so that is really the foundation of why it's important to include patient voice in when we are assessing a treatment uh, in a clinical trial. Um, but the, the other thing is to understand that, you know, patient reported outcome, um, it, we can only secure and improve where we are and where we are heading by involving patients as part of any studies that we do. Patients have to be there as part of the research team. Patient engagement in research is very important. And that's how we would be able to improve, you know, the inclusion of the patient reported outcome in clinical trials moving forward. Um, I don't know whether I've said enough, Jan, but happy to go uh, more than that, but I want to not dominate the uh, panel discussion. No, that's a, that's a great, uh, great discussion point, um, uh, Sam. And I probably want to turn around that question. We've seen the numbers um, uh, that Lisa presented about, uh, let's see, the low proportion of trials that are really collecting quality of life data. So what is now uh, cause and effect? Is it because there's a lack of patient involvement in trial design and that's why quality of life doesn't get the attention in trial design? 
or is it because trial design doesn't look at it and let's say patient involvement is an independent factor of that or it comes further down the line? So do we need patient involvement to make that happen? What's your perspective? Well, they're, they're twofold. One is uh, we need to change the mindset. Still, a lot of the pharmaceutical companies, uh, academic researchers want to include patient reported outcome because uh, it's, it's sexy to do. Uh, they want to tick, tick, you know, it's a tick box exercise. Whereas actually believing that it's a good thing to do, it's an important thing to do, it's telling us something that other clinical parameters and biomedical parameters is not telling us. And the second is really we, we need to have more involvement of the patient. The patient engagement in research in, is very important to be able to, I'm only saying that from the experience because now for the last 10 years at least, um, I have categorically said to all the sponsors, I'm not going to be involved in any quality of life PRO studies if I don't have a patient uh, as part of the research panel, not as a, a participant, but as a member of the research team. Now, I have seen the benefit. My colleagues have seen the benefit of having the patients as a panel. Um, and it's absolutely an eye-opener um, because they will also get involved in the design of the protocol from the start. They look at the interview checklist, interviewing patients. They look at the papers that is written, they review the papers. You know, from the, you know, A to Z, it's a, absolutely valuable uh, asset to, to have uh, as, a, as a patient on the panel of the, the researchers. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much. And probably just reflecting, and Beate, I've seen your hand up. I'm going to ask you in, in a second, just one more question to Kate. I mean, um, so now that we have that, you've made a very strong call with recommendation one saying that quality of life should be measured in all multiple myeloma trials from phase two. So why doesn't it then happen? Um, so what, what's, what's, what's the issue there um, that actually quality of life is not being raised or there's a lot of missing quality of life data? What's your perspective then? Because you're strongly calling for that change and Sam has said, we've come a long way already. So where's the issue? So I think, um, I think there is a, a continuing perspective that um, a lot of the sort of regulatory um, and decision making is focused around um, traditional endpoints around survival, which is understandable. But I think we need to continue the shift towards quality of life and improvements. Um, I also think um, we've seen increases. So pharmaceutical companies do a better job than academics than than gathering quality of life data. And I think a core reason behind that is because they are, they are obviously engaging with the EMA and they're engaging with HTA bodies, whereas in academia, that they're, they're not designing trials that are going to get them reimbursement at the end. So I think um, there's some education that we need to be doing with some of the myeloma community around the importance of um, gathering quality of life data um, throughout the trials. Um, and I think we'll get there, but it's just... Um, patient advocacy is getting a lot more sophisticated around the topic of quality of life. And I think, um, as you said earlier, only through patient involvement in, um, in trial design and in PRO selection and showing that we actually can do a really good job when we speak about it, will we see increasing um, shift to, to the positive. Thank you so much. And I'm Kate, you mentioned HJ and probably now, Beate, it's your call. So HJ, what's, what's your perspective on that? Um, yes, maybe first of all, I would like to, to agree with, um, with Sam's and Kate's suggestions that the involvement of patients in trial planning um, is one, one way to ensure that this uh, relevant data is collected. Um, one, I think HDA actually is another, is, is another way um, that, um, that increased uh, the availability of this data because I, I would say over the past 10 years, um, PROs and quality of life has been included into HDA decision making as a as a standard um, as a standard part of decision making. So I think generally across Europe, um, HDA bodies um, want to see data on mortality, but also on mortality on morbidity and health related quality of life. For example, in Germany, the requirement to provide health related quality of life or to include health related quality of life into decision making is in the law. Um, 
And um, morbidity, on the other hand, also very often can only be collected by patient reported outcomes, if you look at symptoms, for example. Um, and therefore, I feel that because HDA is putting more emphasis on this type of endpoints, um, this has been, we have seen an increasing amount of data um, with that. I mean, plus I can only report from, from our German context, we have um, hearings on, on each of our assessments and patient representatives are part of these hearings. And I can tell you that they are giving every trialist a hard time that uh, who didn't include um, quality of life and PROs into their studies. So um, I think indeed that um, patient representatives do have a role here. Hmm. And can I can I ask one question to you, Beate, and also to Francesco uh, about the regulatory sphere? I mean, if we assumed uh, that quality of life data was there, does it really help with access to medicine? So does it really matter on the decisions that you take um, in terms of pro? Does it really influence decisions you take or is that an add-on to clinical data? Is it just a tipping point? Um, well, actually, um, we are we are not, um, as an HDA body, we are not um, finally deciding on access that is done um, at, at different stages of the process. However, access decisions are the easier, the more robust. So I think Beate's um, internet connection seems to be stuck. I give her two, two more seconds to recover. Probably until Beate comes back, shall we, can I just pass on to, to you, Francesco, and moving just one step ahead, not to access, but to regulatory, how much role does it play? Yeah, sure. And I think there is still a perception that regulatory decision, which look at, let's say, benefit risk, are mainly driven by a, a hierarchy of endpoints where overall survival is high at the top and everything else come, comes lower. And I think this is somewhat a misconception. And in fact, there are numerous reports which in the literature which candidly attack us for even not giving enough um, uh, importance to uh, survival type of endpoints. My view in this is, is different. I think over the years, we've tried to develop a framework that looks at all the available data. And these are primary, secondary endpoints. If you look at our benefit risk assessment framework, you see a table where we list what are considered to be important good effects and, and bad effects and how we put them all together using when we have them patient preferences or, or, or something similar. So in this more comprehensive framework, I think quality of life like survival endpoints play definitely their role. And I see um, this very much from my perspective, really not as a debate, like Kate was saying, quality of life versus clinical endpoints or vice versa, but how do we make the best of, you know, having systematic approaches to put together all of these endpoints, all of which are relevant, all of which weigh probably differently, depending on the situation, depending on the um, on the individual who is making the decision or the regulator in myeloma, like Simone was saying, in many relapsed refractory situation, questions about tolerability and, and optimizing dose and schedules are becoming very important. And then this quality of life tool can really serve a, a key purpose in guiding our optimization efforts. And perhaps in first line, this is somewhat a, uh, a, a less critical question, uh, by no means unimportant. So yeah, they do have a role, uh, Jan, and sometimes a critical role. Okay, super, thank you. Probably, I mean, I don't know, Lisa, if you still want to comment, but I would find that very interesting because in the data that you've presented, you were actually talking about uh, quality of data in nice technology appraisals and multiple myeloma. So how does, does that resonate to you, what you heard from Beate and from Francesco in terms of what role does it play? 
Yes, so NICE has a slightly different decision-making framework compared to other HT agencies because it looks at cost effectiveness and qualities specifically. So there it does play, I would say, critical role. And there are particular circumstances where, let's say, the role of quality of life might be downplayed. For example, if we look at the uh, product which has uh, unquestionable clinical benefit, uh, just the survival is not even... A question it's it's very very clear benefit then uh it's a yes everyone wants this product and uh unless there are some severe adverse events uh that would be taken forward how how often do we see something like that very rarely so that's why um we start looking at all the evidence and nice looks at two things survival and improvement in quality of life. And especially now, especially in myeloma, we cannot run uh, very long trials. We have surrogate endpoints. We hope for advanced survival. We don't have this data and it all comes down to the quality of life. So in myeloma, it's particularly important. It's very, very important in myeloma because it's a unique condition where uh, we use triple quadruple <laughs> combinations of products and the more we add to the patient the more toxicity it adds and uh even though we may say oh we've been using this product for decades now it's used in a new combination now it puts more pressure and then many 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 lines so quality of life of the patient changes and i think particularly in myeloma there are if we look at some of the diseases the the, the caveats uh, but that's an important point for decision making. And um, sometimes, especially at NICE, it might be the driver. And the driver is, I would say, to the company, because we look at company drugs, right? And uh, what happens is if quality of life data is particularly poor, it hasn't been collected. They used some paper from 2004 and trying to, to get utility values from there. Uh, the end result for the company is that for them to be cost effective, they could, the NICE will push them down on price. They push them down on price if they cannot demonstrate uh, high quality, quality of life data. And I mean, they might actually, there's another side of the story to this, is that uh, they might have brilliant methodological approach. Uh, and uh, the quality of life data has been collected appropriately, relevant distributes, everything, but there is no improvement. So that's also, uh, of course, impact on decision making. So we need to see what the drug actually does or the combination of drugs, but then quality. Uh, but what I've showed to you is we've been struggling with actually what is presented by the committee. And I will agree with Beati, this is my last sentence, just to, to cut it, that we are uh, seeing that in phase three interventional studies by the industry, collection of quality of life data has been improving. So uh, that's definitely the case. You've seen, I haven't shown you the longitudinal information, but in phase three, uh, we have been improving. So it's happening. Uh, but another concern, we found 93 quality of life instruments. So there are challenges. Mm. Uh, Sam, I actually saw you nodding on the issue of quality and improvement over time. So what's your comment on that? <laughs> well, um, I think one thing that um, perhaps uh, hasn't improved uh, is uh, not only just including quality of life in clinical trial, but collecting uh, good data, um, you know, not, not we have to do the right thing, but also we have to do the right thing right. Um, you know, I've seen many clinical trial data, quality of life data in recent years uh, that, you know, sadly they haven't even uh, either not collected at the right time points or not enough number of them during the trial. That's very difficult to actually many, make any sense out of it. So I think what Kate mentioned that is it that's the issue that we are trying to address uh, for the uh, work that we have undertaken under the auspices of the EHA as part of our work and the uh, scientific working group to develop guideline uh, for the use and the reporting uh, of uh, patient reported outcomes in hematological malignancy clinical trials. And in fact, the first guidelines that we have developed as Kate mentioned, is in multiple myeloma, and that has been, um, you know, the systematic review has been published, and uh, the um, guidelines, actual guidelines, have been submitted uh, for publication. 
Um, so I think that's quite important. Again, there are other organizations such as Consort. I'm sure that Jan, uh, you, you know about that. They have also produced uh, some guidelines for the assessment of the uh, quality of the patient reported outcome reported in the literature. And, you know, I would uh, recommend, you know, everyone who wants to use quality of life in their trial to actually refer to the consort, you know, checklist. Um, so, yes, uh, I mean, the other thing that I like to perhaps um, uh, come back to what Lisa said and Beata said, what we don't know from the HTA uh, agencies is how much value they actually put on quality of life data on its own, not quality of life factored into the economic equation. The actual quality of life data, that is the benefit considered by the patients to them, how much value is put on that in their decision making. That is not really clear. We know that they take the um, uh, cost utility analysis, where that you include both quality and quantity of life in the equation, but we don't actually know how much value they put on the quality of life itself. Now, I think it's important to recognize that the quality of life factored into the cost utility analysis is a different aspect than looking at the quality of life and the benefit considered by the patients. And so that's the other thing. Now, as far as the regulators is concerned, what Francisco said, unfortunately, the benefit risk ratio that they look at, it has not actually got the patient element in terms of the tolerability of risk. The risk perception is very different from, you know, from one person to the other. You know, somebody, you know, would uh, do bungee jumping with uh, no problem at all, no risk is considered, whereas, you know, I wouldn't do jumping jump, that's very serious and risky thing for me. So the risk perception um, is not actually taken into account by the regulator from the patient's perspective, uh, and therefore, that also we don't know uh, how, how they make their decision making based on patients' perception. Mm, thank you so much. I mean, you're raising important points on quality and quantity. I don't know, Beate, did you want to come come directly on that and want to comment on that? Uh, yes, maybe for the question um, uh, of how we value that, and and it seems I was kicked out last time, so please bear with me if I repeat my <laughs> uh, anything I say. Actually, um, um, it's indeed a different a difference whether you go to the cost utility analysis or, or whether you look at the at the data themselves as at at how symptoms are reported by patients or uh, as how quality of life is reported by, by patient. And uh, across Europe, there are different approaches to that. So there are countries which use cost effectiveness analysis and go via the cost utility approach. And there are other countries um, like, like France or Germany, which, which look at the kind of clinical side um, of, of, uh, of the benefit of a, of a new drug. And, and at that point, we directly look at symptoms, for example, or at quality of life. So we have concluded um, for an added benefit for a drug um, solely based on symptom data or on quality of life data without going via a cost utility analysis. So this can um, have a direct impact on the conclusion on added benefit of a of a new drug. And of course, um, this is the more important in the situations where you are maybe not able to show an overall survival um, effect um, because it may take very long to, um, to be able to um, robustly measure that. Um, especially in these situations, um, an improvement in uh, symptoms, for example, or quality of life might be a valuable addition. I mean, plus we feel that is a valuable addition anyway, because patients want to know that in their treatment decisions. They want to know how they will feel if they, um, if they choose a certain treatment. Thank you so much, Beate. I see Francesco's hand coming up straight after that. So do you want to comment on this, Francesco? No, I wanted to comment to something that Sam said, uh, that the benefit risk uh, assessment by regulators is, uh, let's say, insensitive to the risk attitudes of, 
of individuals and 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 I think that is has been definitely true in the past, but since quite uh, some time we have tried to um, to be quite more explicit about uh, what risk attitudes are are considered and in fact we have uh, let's say in in general uh, use an approach that is that is modulated and, and tries to understand what is the sensitivity to the preferences uh, of each decision. And in situations where uh, decisions obviously depend on the different risk attitudes, where then these are identified and highlighted. And in fact, there is an IMI project called uh, Prefer that has worked on this concept quite a lot. And before this, uh, MDIC uh, in the US uh, has produced guidelines which kind of led to also FDA guidance in this area, uh, in the area of diagnostics, recognizing uh, patient sensitivity. So I think why, why this was true some time ago, I think the regulator nowadays uh, tries to really uh, focus very much on patient perspectives. And when we make our decisions, we do consider patients who are, uh, yes, let's say most uh, tolerant to, uh, uh, to have attitudes of more tolerance to harms and, and vice versa that value most uh, benefits, even benefits that on a wider scale maybe are not considered to be the most convincing, say, for other, other decisions. And um, again, referring to some reports, we have been come under scrutiny because there is no universal value given to these endpoints in oncology, some uh, progression-free survival or whatever. But for me, what's more important is, is how to move forward. And, and I think um, in many situations, we have to recognize that all the regu regulator can do is to describe the effects and then make sure that these are taken into account at clinical level when making the clinical decisions using the individual preferences of the patients. And I think that's how we need to work and perhaps even improve our communication of, of, of our assessments to make them even more useful in the clinical context. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to um, just come back to one point that I've heard a couple of times from a number of you, and we hear that very often. It's about quality, the quality of the data. If we think about, um, uh, we often hear the methodology is not sound, the, the quality of life data is not of good quality enough to actually take account of that in regulatory decisions. So there's this whole discussion about uh, are we giving enough guidance about the collection of pro data? And I know Kate probably first to you because your third recommendation from MP was around uh, recommendations on the collection of pro data. What's your perspective on that? And then also probably Beata and Francesco to comment on that. Are we asking for too much regulation or do we have too little? I think in, in terms of the guidance point, um, I think as I said in my presentation, our perspective in the patient advocacy community is that um, there are lots of different recommendations on how to, to gather quality of life data and patient preference data um, and big asks from, for, um, for industry and other researchers. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the direction of travel is set by the FDA um, currently. And I think um, HDA bodies as well ask, as well as the regulator for specific quality of life data. So you have NICE requirements, you have ICWIGS requirements, and the, where the recommendation came from was whether there was the potential to, to align on a European level broadly on, on how, how we should be advising people to generate quality of life data in a way that benefits everybody. Um, and I think that's what we would like to see. Um, other things we, we thought about were around uh, the potential of um, through the, the early dialogues with the, um, the EU regulation on HTA and whether that could be a place where um, advice is provided to industry um, in collaboration with patient organisations and the EMA on how to, to um, to come up with a quality of life approach. Um, and I think scientific advice is, is a core area where um, where industry can engage with um, 
with regulators and HTA bodies to really think about um, meaningful data and to make sure it's good quality. Um, so I'd like to hear um, Francesco and Beata's perspectives on the potential for guidelines and whether that is a good recommendation or, or not. Francesco, do you want to respond to that? Sure, I think it's it's an excellent point, and 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 like Sam very very nicely described, we're going from a from a mindset where people were saying no quality of life data too poorly collected, too biased, too oh yeah there might be some problems in the, with missing data and perhaps even bias, but hey all data have problems and we can look at making the best out of them and improving them. And I think there is this um, strong collaboration going on now uh, precisely in this. Uh, I'm uh, sort of referring to the IMI CISA call project where they're looking at uh, harmonizing uh, these uh, aspects of data collection, design, collection and, and presentation. I think it's hugely important, much more than then, then coming up with a sort of rigid rule of, of, of what's okay or not okay, or which, mm -hmm. which tools are fine or not fine. If you multiply the, the, the aspect of tools with the analytical uh, variance, you have a practically infinite ap uh, application of, of quality of life approaches. So I think the key is to develop principles that we can all agree to, so not not too t detailed guidelines, but things that can work in most settings. And I, I think together with academia, uh, this is very important. And and uh, yeah, just to mention that there is also uh, the, the, the plan to develop some of these guidelines within the context of the ICH, which is a context which is you know, becoming more open to external organization also uh, and more systematic in considering input of external organization. And it's a really, it's, a, it's an invitation to, uh, to, to ERTC and, and, and other, other organizations who are active in this field to try to, uh, to, to make themselves visible in this international context, if not lead them. Thank you. Mm. Probably just asking Sim Simone about this um, consistency of quality of life tools and, and Francesco mentioned, mentioned ICH probably as a platform. I mean, what's your perspective on the consistent use of quality of life tools? We've heard CISICWAL, we've heard ICH. And also in the in the chat, people are commenting about the use in real world evidence, uh, which actually is outside of typical clinical trials, but it's probably very important evidence, even less structured than in clinical trials that could inform regulatory decision-making. What's your perspective on consistent use of the tools? Yes, well, um, I think it's very important to, like you have two different situations and like in the last five years, I think there's been more attention to develop standardized core outcome sets. And there's also a large project where MBA is involved in it's the Harmony Alliance in which we tried to, to, to develop a, a core outcome set of outcomes what matter most to patients. And then you think of survival outcomes as also patient reported outcomes. And then set a kind of standard that is a minimal uh, uh, outcome set that you would like to measure. So I think those kind of developments, um, because there has been two more developed in, developments in Europe like that, like there's the importer project in Spain, they have been developing such a core outcome set for for clinical or for clinical practice, and also in the Netherlands, more attention to value-based healthcare and also to developing item sets. And I think those sets, thinking with like a multidisciplinary team, uh, of course, including patients, patient advocates, and also all people in the field that are expert on a specific disease, that you can come to to a minimal important set that it's, it's something that should be collected uh, for every patient and. Of course, this, the, the scope of this was more um, outside of clinical trials, but I think we can learn of those two worlds, what you're being used in real-world data collection, but also in clinical trials. Um, but then another important thing is, and that's the difference also in clinical trials, I think that you really have to, to look at the research question, like what are the side effect profiles belonging to new treatments that you want to compare and really uh, make sure that you include a patient reported outcome measure capturing those side effects. So uh, what we saw in the presentation was that most patient reported outcome measures that have been used were general outcome measures. 
And I think there's an importance to get a general understanding of the quality of life of patients. But if you want to have, if some treatments have specific profiles, you also need some uh, some tools, some patient reported outcome measure to really capture those. So I always think that um, always go back to your research question and what do you really want to to measure and what what uh, outcome do you expect a difference or a change? That's also an important thing that that's something that we should think of in 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 the future. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Lisa, if you have any comment about that coming also from the data that you've looked at. Uh, I mean, you mentioned also in the in the area of the nice appraisals uh, issues with quality of life data in uh, te technology appraisals. Did you see any data from your, your your research that actually supports or drives standardization of use or addressing the quality issues about quality of life data? Well, NICE specifically is very uh, clear about standardization they want, and they're very, very simple. They just want the Q5D. So <laughs> whether it's a good solution, whether it's addressing uh, the issues we're discussing here is another question, because, uh, of course, there are a lot of limitations to these generic tools, and it's needed for the derivation of utility values for economic evaluation. Thankfully, it's an easy tool to use, and it's good to include. So... But the question is, it's not whether EQ5D solves all the problems. The question is, what else do you need to elicit the actual uh, meaningful measures from patients? Um, and I think uh, there are some interesting comments in the discussion, whether how real world evidence can be used and whether um, uh, additional prompts should be developed. So here I would put a big red button and say, hold on, hold on. We have 93 tools in myeloma. So let's uh, look into this and let's try to clean it up and let's see what, why is this so much? Who, who's making this decision? Where, from which shells are they picking this? When they pick the top five, I'm clear what is decision-making process. When they are going for the rest of 88, I really wonder. And there are some specific issues why, why but it's already a big mess. I also would never say stop, never develop new problems in myeloma. The field is changing. We're getting very new interventions that we don't know what they're doing to patients. So we need to stay agile. But at the same time, I've seen quite a few companies, once again, let's not specifically focus on myeloma here, who come to NICE with a lot of excitement saying, oh, we're developing our own tool. And that's not helpful either because of the validation, because of comparability issues. So I would say the field uh, would definitely benefit from further regulation and standardization, but within reason, because we can't just say, okay, this is one formula to call these boxes you get through, or this is the right thing to do. And uh, one other comment is just in terms of quality or the choice of tools, uh, the very few situations when um, quality of life data collection was the way it should have been at the right times, uh, uh, right number of patients, we have comparative data, we have something uh, very clear. Uh, in the reality, what happens is sometimes companies or other organizations have to set up dedicated quality of life data studies, uh, which are also very important. And these need to be very carefully designed as well. They, they actually, if you embark on something like that, but these can really elicit important information for this group of patients. Um, but also there's a, a good question that I tried to type an answer into uh, whether, uh, what do we do when it's open label study? What do we do if it's an uncontrolled study? Uh, is this even useful to collect quality of life data? Um, and these are very legitimate questions because correct, uh, the data that we'll get from these studies might be by definition, by design of not good quality. What do we do with this? So, uh, and we need to be quite careful not to say, oh, because this is phase two single arm trial, don't collect quality of life data. data. It's very important to collect it because when NICE looks at it, when other decision making makers look at it, they start looking at pooled data from the trials uh, who involved patients at this stage or with this drug. So 
Uh, but it's not helpful if the sta stage two trial used one instrument, stage four trial used other instruments. So it, we need to get this kind of communication and standardization into play and care, be careful not to overburden patients, but be make, doing things fit for purpose. And going back to the suggestion by uh, Kate, yes, scientific advice, uh, joint advice from regulators and HTAs, uh, consultation with experts, it's important to discuss it. That's where companies or academics get this guidance. And my worry is actually more academic studies because for them, the concept of scientific advice doesn't exist and there is no function to go through that. And there is very little dialogue. Where can they get this input? Uh, so that there are a lot of gaps, basically. That's probably um, a question to you, Sam, because academic, I mean, how can we get the academic world to use more pros, um, which I understand is also a criticism. We're always talking about industry and registration studies and so on. So how can the academic world actually drive the use of pro instruments? Do you, do you share that kind of view that there is a problem? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, um, I mean, the problem with academia, uh, Jan, as you know, um, they all have turned into corporates. Uh, so the ethos of the academia has changed. Um, uh, the, the only way that you can actually do some uh, really substantial research is to be able to get the funding. Um, and uh, unlike when you're actually involved in uh, biomedical research, getting funds uh, for doing these type of studies is much more difficult uh, uh, than if you're really doing bench uh, research. Uh, so that's, I think, the major problem in academia, as, as I can. I have been very fortunate because of my contact and a number of other activities that I've had. Um, you know, I've always managed to get funds from industry to be able to do these sort of things. So that's uh, uh, the, the answer to your question. But there are three things that I really want to mention um, uh, in relation to what other speakers uh, have um, uh, mentioned. Now, I, I really like the uh, Francesco's idea of um, uh, influencing ICH, coming out with uh, some guidelines regarding, um, you know, the use of the PROs in clinical trials. Um, and I think that also fits in with Kate's uh, number, four, number four recommendations. Um, I think if we do develop it at uh, the level of the ICH, it will have some teeth. Uh, and I think, you know, um, uh, everybody will, uh, you know, follow I ICH, as, as you all know, in the, in the major uh, countries in the world. Um, now, the other issue that I like to mention when uh, Lisa um, comment, we really got to influence uh, NICE to move away from EQ5D. It's a terrible measure. The NICE knows that it's a terrible measure. Um, uh, and, you know, we have done a number of studies, you know, looking at the EQ5D, but also it's intended for, as Lisa said, generating utility values. It's not a purely specific quality of life measure. Um, so, you know, we've got to, you know, move away from that. Um, now, in terms of the number of 93 tools that Lisa managed to find in the study, now, that's another issue that we need to tackle, you know, perhaps, you know, at the level of the International Society of Quality of Life Research, we could take that, um, you know, um, uh, our responsibility. Um, uh, you know, we, get, we have to come up with a handful of tools and also people should really be prevented from, um, you know, going on in developing new tools. This really creates an anarchy in the whole field of the quality of life. We have to have a few very um, robust, uh, developed, um, uh, you know, it, using the right methodology uh, and making sure that the precision of these measure, if not better, just as good as the clinical parameters. Um, now, in terms of the generic measures, um, you know, we have to be, again, look at it very carefully. Um, a lot of the measures that are used in hematological malignancies vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, multiple myeloma, they have not been specifically developed for hematological malignancy. They have been developed for uh, solid tumors, and then some questions have been added for, you know, hematological malignancy 
uh, at the later stage. And now the only one, for example, has been specifically developed for multiple myeloma is MyPOS. Uh, and of course, you know, HMPRO, which is uh, developed specifically uh, for uh, hematological malignancy. Um, now that is a generic measure for all the hematological malignancy. And, you know, there are a number of studies have been uh, done to look at that, you know, they discriminate between different hematological malignancies. Now, what I'd like to leave uh, you, Jan, with, perhaps we also need a webinar for the use of the patient reported outcome in clinical practice. I think that's also equally important as this correct use in clinical, uh, clinical trials. Um, you know, we, we need to do, you know, if you like, tackle these, you know, um, um, at the same time in tandem, because the more patients become aware of the use of these in clinical practice on day to day, um, uh, you know, clinicians dealing with individual patients, then also their expectations would be that that information would also trickle down into the clinical trials. And I know, Sam, you have been a pioneer with HM Pro actually to also try to drive adoption and clinical use and clinical practice use of uh, patient reported outcomes. So that's that's very important. I mean, Kate, um, what I hear from the group is saying we don't need number 94 uh, of pro instruments. We need more effective, better quality use of what we have. And I remember you presented recommendation number two about creating a prom platform. Uh, to uh, on the use of pros and uh, what kind of pros exist because quite often there don't seem to be awareness about doesn't seem to be awareness about which prompts to use when is that the intent or what's what's your perspective You're sorry muted. i was on yes. mute of course i was <laughs> um so um that was the intention so i think um having an online system so i think there's something in the uk called promise where you can um if you want to to use quality of life, you can kind of pick and choose like, tools that are appropriate to your um, research question. And I think that's that's kind of how we envis envisioned it, is that it would be something where researchers could go on and see the main tools. Um, and perhaps there would be a checklist where it's like patients have validated it, um, patients support its use. It's been developed specifically in myeloma and potentially, um, and I'm not sure how possible it is, but um, kind of specifying how it could be used and which treatments are most appropriate for. So, for example, in CAR T, we're struggling um, to measure that appropriately because um, all of the tools were developed before CAR T um, was uh, around. In the the side effects are very new. Um, so whether there's whether it could go into that kind of granularity or whether we could link recommendation two to recommendation four, where we have um, a, a really a, a really high level consensus amongst um, clinicians, PRO methodologists, patient groups on the, the key PRO tools in myeloma in which treatments they could be used in. I'm not sure how likely that is or, or how granular that we could get, but I think that's how we see it is, is I think we need we need to steer the ship a bit more in myeloma with PRO selection. Um, and these were kind of the thoughts we had around doing that. Super, thank you so much. I don't know, Beate, if you want to, you had your hand up quite a while. Do you want to comment straight on that? on something before, sorry, you're uh, muted. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, actually that, that was on a, on a different issue, but maybe maybe for, for that point, I, I think um, I would very much um, um, support the idea of core outcome sets. And um, this could then also include uh, the approach to, um, to quality of life and PRO instruments. Um, and I can see your point that there might be um, new issues coming up with new treatments but in the end probably you, you could break down that to to generic principles that would also apply like um, probably it would also um, include pain and fatigue and um, anxiety and things so so general concepts which you could measure with which could still very be a very good reflection of the situation in which the patient is, even, even if this comes from a from a new type of treatment. So that might be the way to go, rather than try to specifically um, figure out what what is new with this treatment. I 
I, I actually I wanted to follow up on an on a point Elisa was making, and that is concerning your first re recommendation, in which you say move quality of life at least to phase two. I would say ensure that you have studies that allow interpretation of quality of life data. And uh, interpretation of quality of life data is only possible in controlled studies. Um, so it doesn't help if you move quality of life to single arm studies, that will get you nowhere. I mean, that is in principle true for many endpoints, but specifically for PROs and quality of life, it will be important that you have controlled studies Otherwise, I wouldn't know how to interpret this type of data. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Beate. And I think, uh, let's say, robust data is the core of everything. So thank you so much for, for making that point. I know that we're uh, almost at the end of time for this webinar. I would love to go on for another hour because I still have a couple of topics that I'd like to pick your brains on. But unfortunately, I mean, people need to do something something else probably after this exciting webinar. So I have a last question to each of you um, because, I mean, patient organizations need to focus their resources. They need to think about where can they have highest impact on what they're doing. And MP has actually uh, presented uh, four recommendations. First one was about researchers should consider the collection of quality of, of life data on, on in all myeloma clinical trials, at least from phase two. Number two was research to collaborate on the creation of a user-friendly database on patient reported outcome measures. Number three was clearer recommendations on the collection of quality of life data and clinical development to support regulatory HTA decision-making. And number four was actually a more international multi-state called a steering group comprising of patients, clinicians, pro methodologies, regulators, and policymakers to actually allow a consistent approach to a collecting quality of life data. So Christmas time, just wish one. Um, what would you recommend MPE or the myeloma community to focus on if you have to choose? Who do I pick first? Simone, can I ask you first? Of course, and I think I have to answer shortly because we have three minutes, but um, I would try to, to see if we could raise the percentage of using this very important uh, patient reported outcome, the patient perspective in evaluating treatment. So Super. raising that percentage. Super, thank you so much. Lisa, you want to go next? Uh, yes, I'll go with number three, potential to have clearer requirements on the collection of QL data, because I think it's the most doable and might lead to practical results faster. I can't avoid, is this also a real recommendation, Francesco? I agree with Lisa, but I want to move away from the term requirement and more to agree on sound scientific principles on what scientific question to prioritize and what tools we can use to answer them. Would this been be your recommendation? Also, I biased your response. So, would have the, out of the four, would have the, that been your preference? Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. Beate, what do you think? Well, actually, I would also go for three, um, and would would want to add that we should achieve that we handle quality of life endpoints as we do others. Because we know how to how to properly collect and analyze endpoints, and we would just need to move this type of endpoints to that level. Super, thank you so much. And finally, Sam, what's your perspective? Yeah, I would I would also uh, uh, suggest uh, uh, number three, um, but also uh, adding to it, um, I would like the uh, Gates Group. Uh, the uh, Myeloma Patient Europe uh, to also be more involved and all the stakeholders who want to do clinical trials to utilize the expertise that exists within the um, Myeloma Patient Europe uh, to, in terms of, you know, what tools to use for the clinical trials and what time points. Uh, I think the industries in particular should utilize the sophisticated um, expertise that the patient uh, organizations have these days uh, to advise them, um, you know, for the use of the PROs um, in the design of their studies. Okay, super. That's great. So finally, Kate, you got the final word. You heard all the wishes and the and, uh, choice out of the four. So what's your final recollection before we close the web uh, webinar? 
Um, I think um, we'll take three forward because everyone um, is in agreement we need um, guidelines. Um, the other thing I was thinking um, was around Lisa's comment uh, about academic um, trialists and whether there's also, as well as having pan-European guidelines, we need to do something more as a community um, in collaboration with the EMN um, and EHA to disseminate um, the, the message around generating quality of life um, and PRO measures through clinical trials. And I think that's something we'll take forward. Um, but thank you all so much for um, the really helpful feedback on the recommendations and we'll um, send you the report on Monday. Thank Super. Thank you. thank you so much. You've be, all been fantastic. I, I can't wait to listen to the recording again. And thank you so much for being with us today and see you soon in the quality of life sphere. Thank you so much.